Most people know just how treacherous Gaspipe Castle was. Many of the murders that took place came to be in one form or another as a result of him. And let's call a spade a spade. Vicar Musa was no better. Up until the point of when they went on a lamb, they were thick as thieves. But there came a point when Gaspipe not only attempted to cause an eternal war within the Lucchese family, but a war with another family. Let's get into it. On May 30th, 1990, a Brooklyn federal grand jury indicted 15 members of organized crime, including bosses Chin Giganti, Pete Gotti, Vic Amuso, and Gaspipe Castle, among others. The indictment was in regard to a racketeering case with the control of window replacements throughout New York City in what would become known as the window case. Prior to the indictment, Gaspipe had two crooked NYPD detectives, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa, on his payroll, his crystal ball as he named them. And it was through them he learned of the imminent indictment. As a result, both he and Vic decided to lamb it. Before doing so, Gaspipe met with Al Diaco, who at the time was a Lucchese captain, in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. After explaining their predicament, he told Diaco that they would be in touch. Over the course of time, Diaco would be made acting boss. Vic and Gas, by now deemed fugitives, split up during their time spent on a lamb, with Vic staying in the Scranton, Pennsylvania area and Gas Pipe in Mount Olive, New Jersey. In an effort to run the family, as I mentioned, they placed Al Diaco in the acting boss position. However, they would eventually turn on Diaco, labeling him no good and mocking him for death at which time a series of panels would be put in place. During the time Vic and Gas spent as fugitives, life of the Lucchese members was uncertain and everyone lived on shaky grounds. For example, today you're a good guy, tomorrow you're labeled a rat, and within a week they kill you. Naturally, the fugitive bosses needed to meet, not only with each other, but with the Arco while he was in good graces, the panel members, and family members as well. In order to accomplish this, Lucchese member Patty Testa was someone put in charge of arranging these covert meetings, as well as relaying messages. Messages that traveled between the two bosses, as well as any messages sent out to family members. Patty, a Brooklyn guy, specifically Canarsie, was originally a Gambino associate, along with his brother Joey, and part of the Roy DeMeo crew. Following DeMeo's murder, like his brother, he became a member of the Lucchese family. Essentially, Patty became a high-level messenger, and the saying, don't shoot the messenger, would prove to ring true as this story develops. A critical part of the story was the attempt made on gas pipe in 1986. This took place just a few months before Vic and Gas took control of the Lucchese family. The reasons behind the attempt was Gaspipe calling Gambino member Angelo Ruggiero a rat, something the Lucchese had a very bad habit of doing. Also, there was a fallout between Gaspipe and Gambino member Mickey Boy Paradiso regarding their joint venture in the drug business. With a nod from Ruggiero, Mickey Boy would handle taking care of Gaspipe. He assigned associate Jimmy Heidel to carry out the hit. Heidel recruited Nicholas Guido and Robert Bering to assist them in the hit. A meeting was set up to lure Gaspipe into a trap on September 6, 1986. The meeting was being held at East 71st Street in Canarsie, Brooklyn, the location of the Golden Ox Chinese restaurant. When Gaspipe arrived, before heading into the restaurant, he sat in his Lincoln Town car while finishing an ice cream. At some point, a blue Plymouth pulled alongside him, and Heidel fired into the Lincoln with a 12-gauge shotgun, hitting gas pipe in the neck and shoulder. He managed to crawl out of his passenger door and make it into the restaurant to call for help. He called Vic, who took him to the hospital, and he survived his injuries. On a side note, following the shooting, the police found in Gaspipe's Lincoln a confidential list of license plates to unmarked cars that were used for surveillance by law enforcement. Gaspipe eventually found out who was responsible and had the two crooked detectives falsely arrest Heidel and deliver him right into his hands. While torturing Heidel and before putting him out of his misery, he extracted from him who gave the order and Heidel told him Mickey Boy. So the hit came from the Gambinos, a fact Gaspipe would never forget and wouldn't be able to swallow. While on the street, old Vic and Gas had their own core group of guys who were loyal to them. 
And during their time spent as fugitives, Gaspipe used his guys to secretly create two factions. More crucially, he had an agenda that didn't include Vic. As messages came to him via Patty Testa, he began to question the authenticity of what was being told to him. And messages that he sent through Patty out to the street was first being run by Vic, obviously in order that Vic gave to Patty, one that enraged Gaspipe. And being Vic was the boss, he focused all his anger on Patty, the messenger. Gaspipe's time spent away from Vic caused him to think more independently, which he obviously enjoyed. The only thing that stood in the way of him calling all the shots was Vic. On July 29, 1991, Vic traveled with Freddie Johnson, who happened to be Patty Testa's nephew, to the Scranton Mall. He had a scheduled call with Gaspipe. As most of us know, while in the mall and after speaking with Gaspipe on a payphone, FBI agents who were lying in wait locked up Vic and Freddie Johnson. At some point after their arrest, Freddie Johnson turned to Vic and told him that whoever he was speaking to on the phone was a rat because they gave them up. Vic responded with, watch what you're saying, that was gas on the phone. Meanwhile, little did he know, it was Gaspipe who gave him up. The FBI claimed Vic was captured from a tip that came in from the March 15, 1991 episode of America's Most Wanted that featured Vic. Nevertheless, it was Gaspipe just removing that one obstacle that stood in his way. With Vic in prison, he now called all the shots in the family. Being that he had total control, there were two things on the top of his list that he wanted to deal with. The Gambinos and Patty Testa. And in Gaspipe's mind, he'd kill two birds with one stone. Let me quickly remind everyone to like this video, as well as the super thanks icon found beneath this video, put there for anyone who'd like to show appreciation for videos like this. On December 2nd, 1992, at 11.30 a.m., Patty Testa was in his office at a garage at 432 East 89th Street in Canarsie, Brooklyn, when a shooter appeared, hitting him nine times with a 9mm in the head and upper body. The shooter then jumped into a waiting black Cadillac and sped away. The Patty Testa hit was given to Frankie Lasterino, and afterwards, Gaspipe had Frankie put the word out that the Gambinos were responsible, and it was retaliation for the Frankie DeChico and Barbie Borriello hits. Gaspipe would also send word to Vic in prison, stating the same thing. Vic had no clue that Gaspipe ordered the hit on Patty, and he wanted a full investigation into whether the Gambinos were involved. He ultimately agreed to hits on Nicky Carrazzo and John Jr. Gotti. The Lucchese's always had a strong dislike for John Jr. Those hits were never carried out due to the massive Lucchese indictments and arrest, including gas pipes on January 19, 1993. Only one part of gas pipes plan came to fruition. Had his entire plan worked out, he would have started a war with the Gambinos. Most people are under the impression that guys in the mob are very smart at least street smart. But this story is an example of how easily they could be manipulated.